Hi everybody. Today we are going to talk about data science career and we're doing a ask me anything. A lot of people ask me Andreas tips around data science, data scientist careers and as I'm the engineer, I'm not the super expert in this. So I brought somebody on who is really good at this. Uh, Andrew Jones, Andrew worked at Amazon, worked at PlayStation. He has his own academy or his own program, Data Science Infinity, where he teaches data science. And um, basically my counterpart in the data scientist realm. So let's get, it, get him in and say hello, everybody. Hello, hello, how are you doing, Andreas? Hi, Andrew. Welcome to the stream. Great that you're here. Thank you. So let's focus this on data science, data scientist topics, not engineering today. And yeah, Andrew, for everybody who doesn't know you, that is usually in my bubble. Can you say a few words about yourself, about yeah, what you do? Yeah, so uh, my name is Andrew Jones. I, I worked as a data scientist or, or a data, data analyst for a long time. And then, like Andrea said, I was very fortunate to have worked for Amazon for a number of years. Uh, Sony PlayStation for a number of years where I got to uh, build and prototype machine learning based features for the PlayStation 5, which was really cool. Some of those have gone on to be patented by Sony. Um, and then I shifted over to uh, run my own data science program, which which Andreas alluded to a moment ago. And I've been doing that for the last couple of years now. That's called Data Science Infinity. And it's it's built out of the fact that so many data science programs were leading people to dead ends. They, they weren't teaching the right things. They weren't teaching people in the right way. And they weren't helping, you know, to actually successfully move themselves into their career, into a career that they, that they love. Uh, so that's what I do all day, every day. And I love it. It's uh, it's a field that I love. And, and I, I found that I really love teaching. So like Andreas says, we're kind of counterparts. We, we talk to each other a lot about um about running a program it's it's a lot of hard work but um we both enjoy it i think so that's that's the main bit well, that's true i think we started around the same time as well like what was that 2020 something around that 2020 2021 yeah right i think so you you were still at bosch right when you yeah. started it you kind of were doing both yeah i yeah. sort of i i had to well, I, I was working for PlayStation as a as a consultant and the whole the whole marketplace of um, consulting and contracting changed in the UK and therefore companies were just getting rid of their contractors. So I, mm -hmm. I ended up moving away from Sony at that point. And that was the moment that I that I said, you know, I, I should do I should finally do this thing that I've, that I've always wanted to do, which was do my own thing. I had all this code and all of this you know, these projects that I'd built and I thought there must be some value in this, you know, and, and I'd been very fortunate in a lot of those companies as well too. And I think this is the key thing that made me believe that I could, I could do this was I just happened to interview and screen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, you know, data scientists, data analysts, data engineers during my time. And that was such a, an eye opening part of the, the, my time there that, that led me to kind of, I guess, understand firsthand or see firsthand what the differences are between people who impress in interviews and land the role versus those who who struggle through it and maybe miss out time and time and time again and that piece of information or those learnings are the, are the fundamental part of data science infinity at least that kind of set it apart in my view from some other programs yeah it's so what because i'm guessing you had the option back then to go more into consulting or go towards the educational route. Like, yeah. Was so that I, was that the easy decision? Or <laughs> I had always wanted to do something myself. I'd always wanted to own my own. I think my my initial dream, you know, let's say 2014, 2015, through that sort of period of time, was to have my own business because I just wanted to. That probably in my head existed as like a data analytics consultancy where I'd go and have clients and I'd I'd work on projects for them. I, I'd never I, I'd never really thought about creating a program or, or becoming a kind of a teacher, I guess, until near where it happened because I was just thinking, you know, what is the next step? Like I said, I'd sort of through reasons out of my own control, I had left the or had been dropped from sony because they were they were you know jettisoning all of their contractors 
Um, and therefore that was the time that it just felt right. But yeah, I, I, I thought about doing more consultancy in some shape or form. I, I, I was interviewing for, for other permanent roles, like head of data science roles at, at startups and things which sounded really cool. But, and I got, I, you know, I, I went through the interview process of a few of these companies and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't get back at, you know, I couldn't start again at the bottom, you know, learning a company and everything that I thought this, this has to be the opportunity I, I take to do my own thing. And I didn't know if it would work. You know, it was a big, it was a big plunge into the unknown. Um, and it's been a huge learning curve. I won't, I won't de deny that or, or tiptoe around that. The first year especially was, was extremely hard. The data science stuff itself was kind of the easy bit. It was the, it was running a business and knowing how to talk to people and sell to people and, and, you know, knowing how to support students the best that I can, that was the learning curve. And I've slowly gotten better at that. I'm not, I'm in no way perfect, but you know, I'm, I feel more confident doing it. I think. That's true. Also when you, when you, when it's your own company and when you are the, the teacher, you never, per you never think, Oh, no, I'm very, very good. <laughs> oh yeah. No, not for a second. <laughs> um, there's a question from Reshma here. Uh, let's take this a bit more general because the question is, is, are there any openings right now? How do you see right now the, the data science job market? Because we are in a bit of a downturn for some time. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a few different facets that I've seen, say, since the start of this year. I think the, the first thing that I think we did see a bit of a downturn. We saw a bit of a stall, but something that was interesting was at the start of the year, there were there were so many layoffs happening from Meta and, and Amazon and generally speaking, the sort of fang companies, they were laying off all sorts of data professionals right across the board. Um, and that that was huge. That was huge. There were so many people being laid off, but that took the headlines. That's what everybody thought the market was, that everybody was jettisoning, jettisoning data scientists and data engineers and data analysts. But it wasn't completely true. And there's some really good charts that you see online about what was happening at FANG and they were downsizing. But the rest of the industry was actually going along steadily or in growth. Uh, but you didn't know about that, right? Because every headline around data jobs was driven by FANG because that, that was really big news. So if you weren't working at one of those companies, you were fine. And there were lots of jobs at those companies. And that's not going to change anytime soon because they need people to do data analytics, data science, data engineering. That's never going to change. Um, so at the start of the year, that was true, but it was kind of clouded by this the FANG layoffs. I think the next thing that's come along is is generative AI and the hype around that stealing jobs or taking jobs. I think that that hype peaked a couple of months ago where people were saying, you know, look what it can do. Look at the code it can write. Look what it can do with a CSV of data. It can analyze it. It can. The, there is some huge potential there. It can write code. It can do things with data sets now and it's getting better. But what humans can do is so much more nuanced humans humans have that much deeper understanding of where the company's going and why what we need to do next what are the considerations we need to take on i genuinely believe that there's so much potential in generative ai as we as we talk about i, I don't use the term ai on its own because i think that's not the right term i think it's generative ai um there's so much potential there's so much potential mm -hmm. But I think that's actually going to create more jobs going forward because the, all of the spotlight have been put on data, on machine learning, on, on um, AI in general. All of these things are getting so much more attention now. Companies are starting to understand that there's potential for them if they do start saving their data, cleaning their data, um, looking for value within their data. You know, that, that has become central to the mainstream media almost now. And I think that is going to grow the field more than we ever think. I don't think AI is going to take any jobs, to be honest. It may automate a few things, but the field itself is going to navigate that like it always does. I mean, we've been talking about, um, 
we've been talking about no code solutions taking jobs we've been talking about auto ml taking jobs for year for, since i started in the field there's always been something coming which is going to take the jobs and it never has the field's always navigated it and there's always been there's always been growth and i think we've probably seen a little bit of a flat line but what i'm seeing at the moment in my feed is it's picking up again. I, I really see that. My feed is full of people looking for data scientists and data analysts and mm -hmm. data engineers or people landing roles as the you know as those things. And I think that's going to continue to grow. And then obviously in January, February, March of next year, we always see a bit of a, a, an upstream of, of um, people looking for, for candidates as they're looking to set you know the next year's agenda or the next year's goals and they will need those people. So I think it's actually in really good shape. I think there's been a few... Bits of hype and maybe a few things grabbing the headlines, which have made it seem like it's mm. not as strong as it maybe is. Yeah, so it was basically more of a big tech bubble, and now we're we're still steadily, steadily in a good position with data yeah. science jobs, as you said. Like generative AI generates also new new opportunities. Here's a question from uh, Gandeep here. Like, were the next career options open because of LLMs? What do you think will stick for uh, the next three years or something? Yeah. Is, is there something or is this also more of a bubble where... I, it, I, I, my personal view is that it's both. <laughs> it's part hype on one side and on the other side, there's huge potential. There's both. I think LLMs, generative AI are going to change the landscape a little bit they're gonna they're gonna make th it's gonna make things easier so you know from from a coding point of view the access we have to code now you know we used to use stack overflow to, to get snippets of code and then modify them and figure out how they fit into the puzzle of what we're trying to do we now have something that's much more flexible much more powerful in that than that but I've tried to, you know I, I code in Python I, I build machine learning models etc cetera, etc cetera. but I tried to build, as a bit of an example, I tried to build a web app using like a web app framework because I thought that would be a cool project to just try and do. And even though it was ChatGPT was giving me all the code that I needed and it was explaining it, it was explaining it to me. I still struggled and I couldn't, I couldn't quite get there in terms of getting this thing built. And it, to me, that was a really good moment where i understood that i don't think it's going to come and take jobs like people can't people can't just sit at chat gpt and become an amazing data scientist there's so much more to the mm -hmm. job than just putting code into a box and hitting run it, it, but, it, that's such a small part and i think that the the technical bar has been lowered by something like chat gpt and and models similar to it but there's so much more to being a good data scientist from a from the point of view of a company and driving a company forward and driving value that that's just one tool in the toolkit and i think that's gonna that's gonna increase people's speed at delivery but i don't think it's going to take any jobs but on the other what i mean is on the other side like when you think about the career right now somebody is working or trying to get into data science or is a data scientist and they hear all this talk about generative ai and so on does that really Right. Or how could somebody leverage that now in the point of they are looking for a job there? Is there something specific or, or should they focus on specific topics? So if you're trying to get into data science and data analytics, my advice would be to keep your eye on that stuff. Touch on it, watch videos on it keep learning, keep close to it, just so you know what's happening in that landscape. But so to jump back a step for, for data science infinity, which is all about trying to help people get into the field of data science. So I have a network of around 200 hiring managers and recruiters in the field that I talk to on a regular basis to get a feel for what skills and tools they're actually hiring for in practice. So what are the skills that they really need new data scientists and analysts to have? And it's interesting what they say about the skills and tools that they need from new data scientists. It, it doesn't match the hype. Nobody is hiring new data scientists and new data analysts to come in and work on 
generative AI or to work with large language models or even really referencing ChatGPT because there's there's a lot of concern around how companies actually work with ChatGPT from privacy and security points of view. The reality is the core skill set that people need hasn't really changed. You know, fundamental things like knowledge around SQL and Python, Tableau for data visualization, things like understanding how to use GitHub to some reasonable level so you can collaborate with your team or you can you know, move things towards a, a, a productionized point of view, those things are still what are in demand. So if if you're seeing, if you're thinking, I really want to get into data science or, or AI or whatever you want to call it, I need to go and learn all about how to use ChatGPT for data science. That's not the reality. That may continue to crop up and we may see more things coming out, but they're most likely going to be tools that we can use that you won't be building yourself. 99% of data scientists won't be building those tools themselves. They'll be making use of them to add value within the company that they work for. Um, so it's a little bit of a, a misconception that AI is the thing we all need to focus on because hiring managers aren't really asking for that. If if mm. you put if you push them and make them be honest about it, that's not really what they need. They still need those core skill sets and then all the softer skills that go with it, of course. Um, that's really what people still need for the vast majority of companies. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I had a feeling that it's around that. Um, so you said the basics, uh, focus on the stuff that everybody needs. So how, how do people get the first job in, in that role in data science? How, how do you see your students succeed here? In this so area? I think there's, there's two kind of parts to it. Well, there's three kind of parts to it. There's learning the skills and the tools. And I think you can do that anywhere, to be honest. You you need to know what skills and tools you should learn. I think that's something which is key. There's an ocean of things you could learn. But we, if you go and try and learn all of it, you'll learn on too thin a level. You won't have enough depth in that knowledge. So, so you kind of need to know which boxes most hiring managers are needing. And I mentioned a few of those just before. Um, so in terms of what you need to learn, you do need to focus on those and get a good understanding of those in a way that you can apply in the real world. I think you then need to, you need to then translate that into showcasing those skills. And that's a really big, that's a really big part of the puzzle that people miss. So, you can learn all the skills, but actually getting a job is kind of a, that's kind of a separate project of its own, you know, getting your resume in a way that, you know, into a position where, where it stands out from other candidates or even where it just clearly demonstrates what you can bring to the role in a way that the hiring manager or the recruiter will want to have that second conversation with you or get on the phone to you. That is an art in itself these days because of the competition for roles. Creating a, a portfolio is super important for most roles, especially if it's your first role or if you're transitioning uh, from another field, that's really, really important. Um, but again, a lot of people maybe don't quite understand how to do that really well in a way that will make them stand out. Because um, the, you know, the reality is for most data science roles, you've got 50, 100, 150 people applying for it. You need to be in the top few. So you need to make it really easy for whoever's reading it, if that's the hiring manager or the recruiter, you need to make it really easy for them to quickly see what you bring in, in your communication skills and your problem solving system, et cetera. So there's a bit of an art to that. Um, and I think that that's a big part of what I help people with in the program, I think is, is getting over the line. So not only like, like, here's the skills you need to learn based on me talking to hiring managers, but then how do you, how do you showcase that successfully? Um, I think that's the key bit. The landing the role is almost the harder bit these days. Yeah, that's true. It's also what I see from my students. Um, I, I'm going to let me show you a few comments here, everybody. Let me show you a few comments. And that's also what I hear a lot and basically what we were talking about. Uh, so there's like one that says every uh, job posting in North America has like 500, I guess that's applications mm. or uh, exactly 99% are looking. Not exactly, but are looking for experience, right? Um, I think these are the things that we see, and unfortunately, you need to, yeah, you need to work on your application. You need to work on your mm. your 
showing your skills, right? Like, uh, dear Lab says here, my question is how to get a job as an entry level with two internships. Yeah, it, 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 obviously you've learned the skills if you if you've if you've done that, you've done internships. You probably a lot have a lot of the skills. It really comes down to some networking. So the fact that applying on job boards is such a tricky thing to do. There's you put your application in and often you get nothing back. And I think that's quite demoralizing for people at times. And that's where you see people saying, you know, I've applied for 200 roles and I've got nothing back. Something you can do. So, so networking is a good one. Obviously you have to understand that every time you reach out to somebody, you're not necessarily going to hear back, but, but keep at that, you know, showcase what you can do online, build a brand that can always help. Um, I think, um, yeah, building your own brand is a good one. Networking is a good one. Um, another thing that you can do, if you can find recruitment agents that are in your area, that can be really beneficial because you may still go to them and they may say, look, there's not much that fits for you right now, but you're still going to have that feedback loop. And that's a lot more, that's a lot nicer of a, of a process than just clicking apply on buttons and getting nothing back that is a really hard place to be. Whereas if you can get a recruitment agent, their job is to try and land you a role because if they land you a role, they get commissioned in some shape or form. Um, so they may not have a job for you right now, but what they're going to be able to do hopefully is give you some very quick feedback on where they think your resume or your skill set is miss or is maybe misaligned with, with the jobs that, that they have on their books. Um, and that can be, that can be good because you can then, then go and refine those. There's something there to base your next step of where do I need to go? I need to, maybe, you know, I don't, I haven't worked with Python yet and all the jobs are, or all the jobs are saying Python. So that's the feedback the recruiter gives you. So you can go and do that rather than not, not knowing where you need to go next and just trying to learn whatever you can. That's a really empty process. Whereas if you can get somebody who can just bounce ideas off you, I think that's a much more, you, you won't be applying for as many roles. It's like a smaller a smaller net, but the chances of you getting one of those is, is much greater. Hmm. Do you think the company size matters? Because when I look at my experience back in the days at Bosch, like these huge companies, they can actually um, afford to hire somebody and to train somebody to hire uh, freshers, right? And when you look at the at the startups or the smaller companies, they usually immediately want somebody who is up to speed and can yeah. do day to day work. Right? Do you think uh, that's that's something that could make also make a difference? What's your yeah? There's, there's truth to that. Definitely, definitely. A bigger company is going to have a team of people that you can fit in. Like you say, they can if they see potential in you, and maybe that you you tick most of the core skills that they need, but maybe not everything they're going to be able to to bring you on knowing that they've seen something in you, you know, the way you solve problems, the way you make decisions, you know, justifying which tool you might use and which you might not, you know, things, things which mean they can see that if they put something in front of you, even if you haven't done that exact thing before, that they can be confident that you could go and take that on. Um, yeah, in a bigger company, you're going to, you're going to have more chance than that. Yeah, working in a startup is similar to, to contracting or consulting, there's a lot more expectation that you need to hit the ground running. So, so that's probably a harder thing to do for your very first role. Uh, but it's not un, it's not unheard of. I've got people in, in data science infinity who've gone straight into startups. Um, but again, my, yeah, I guess that's, that's, I'm not trying to sell, sell the course, but that, that is what we're doing. We're really, you know, it's a paid course, but you get the value from that because everything is pointing you towards success. You know, it's, there's a reason why it exists in the way that it does is because that's what we're getting you to. We're pointing everything from the skills to the help with the interviews and everything towards that, that goal. But yeah, bigger companies are always going to be easier to get into. I think when you're starting out. Um, it was one question. I'm a current student in data science. I'm looking for a job actively applying as well. Any suggestions? Kind of just what we've been saying, really. Um, 
Internships? Keep, yeah, internships can be good. Um, just keep building projects that you, th you know, in your, in your spare time, building projects that you can use to showcase the value, your value. Get other people to have a look over your resume. Maybe somebody that you can lean on who may, who may have hired some people in the space, even if they're not looking at the moment, if they can give you five minutes to look over it to see the sort of language that you're using, that can be a big thing because the famous example is, you know, recruiters only look at your CV for however many seconds or whatever. I mean, there's, there's, <laughs> you know, that's different, but there is some truth to it. So you do need to hit them hard straight away with the fact that you meet the criteria for this role. And therefore you go in the, the pile of people we might talk to on the phone for the next step. So you have to hit them, hit them in the face early with the right message. Um, and the only other thing I'd say would be just don't lose your don't lose your confidence. Very few people land a data science role straight away. It's not an easy thing to do. But don't lose your confidence. The worst thing you can do is lose your confidence because confidence is what gets you through the interview process. If you if you're going into interviews feeling feeling like you're going to come out with another rejection, then you probably will. It's a hard thing to do, but even if you even if you miss out on a job, just try not to think of it as a rejection. Think of it as you know one step closer to landing that role that you do want, because there is going to be a role where you fit the bill, and the company sees you as the person who they want to come and do it, and that's the perfect fit. Um, and you're sort of one step closer to that every time. N nobody goes straight in and lands a you know a good data science role first time. It's very, very rare. So just keep going. Yeah. I, I don't know how it is with data scientists, but for engineers, for instance, there's the, the problem that a lot of engineer roles are not are not titled data engineer. There's something like cloud engineer, cloud mm -hmm. developer, or, you know, and a lot of these things where you see from the topics, when you look at the description of the job, there is data engineering in there but they're not called like this so do you have something like that in, in data science as well yeah yeah da i mean data science is is quite a broad term these days it can mean a lot of different things it can mean anything ranging from something quite heavy in data engineering right through to something quite heavy in data analytics and they're very different fields almost you know they're very re they're related but they're different but a data science has become quite a popular term so people like to use it because people want to have that to, you know, they want to have that title. Um, so, so the result of that is that jobs name the roles data scientists to try and attract more people and it became, you know, it snowballed a little bit, but yeah, there's a lot of ambiguity around that. I mean, there's a bigger, there's a bigger topic there, which is that, and I'm, I'm actually, I was saying to you uh, earlier, Andreas, I'm going to Dubai in October to talk at the JITEX conference. And I'm talking on exactly this, the, the fact that, you know, like generally speaking as a field, the way that we think about our data pipelines, the, it's come so far in the last few years, you know, we're getting really good at this now, you know, not everyone, but we're getting there. The machine learning pipelines for, for getting models into production, we're thinking really hard about this and we've progressed so far and the hiring process has just gone nowhere. It's just, it's still garbage people don't put enough emphasis on a sensible hiring process where where a couple of people say hr a senior member of the team and the hiring manager sit down in a room for an hour and actually think hard about like what do we need this person to do what where are we going on our data journey like what do we need to make a job description that's actually accurate that can actually sell the job in a way where the right people know to apply and people who aren't a fit maybe don't apply. So therefore it makes your whole job easier and you don't have to spend all of this time and all of this money as a company very inefficiently trying to hire people. There's so many good candidates in the market at the moment and there's these hiring managers saying they can't find any talent. That's not, that's not the problem of either side. That's the process in the middle. That's mm. It's not coming. It's so frustrating to see that we haven't we haven't progressed that. Um, so I have a lot of sympathy for, for people looking to get roles because a lot of a lot of job descriptions just put the tech stack, whatever data science -y type words they can think of, they seem to put it on the job description and, and people don't really feel confident applying for it. They don't know if that's the right fit for them. 
Um, but, but it's also when I look at engineer jobs, very often it's it's absolutely overpowered what is in the description. Like they want everything and they want you to be an expert in everything, although they most likely need 25% of what is in the description. Right? Mm -hmm. And then people get disencouraged, like, oh, I'm never going to make this, so I'm not going to apply. Also, when I read some job descriptions, I'm thinking like, I, could just, I couldn't have her land this job myself. Yep. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, exactly the same in data science. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> it, the amount of time and money it costs to hire someone in the first place, you've got to make that more efficient. That should be a huge priority mm. for a company to make that more efficient because it's such a waste of time. You, all of the hours of people sitting in interviews with people that aren't the right fit for the job. But then also, if you make a bad hire, we know the cost of that's huge as well. So... I don't know why we're not why we're just sitting stationary on this. It, it seems I see some good job descriptions. I do see a few, but the vast majority are still awful. It's like people are just trying to do it as fast as possible. But is the cost really that high if you hire because you usually have like probation in the job, right? Depending on the company, it can be three months, and like make a dis yeah. decision quick and decide yeah, for but somebody. You've got that person who you've hired, that's say two months of them working on a project, which has some value attached to it. And that's two months where the, the pro, you know, that project doesn't move forward where you need it to be. Um, or perhaps, you know, that person just comes in and because they didn't understand what the company was like, they leave for some sort of more personal reasons, you know, things that could have been found out in the hiring process. I think there's so much more efficiency we can get in that process. That's true. I, I see where I see where you're coming from. What I meant was if the hiring process, like, because sometimes after the process, they still have 15 people where they need to choose from and they take forever to make a decision. Like, mm. how does somebody yeah. move on and if it doesn't work out after a month? Because you're going to see very quickly if somebody fits or doesn't fit and has the yeah, skills or true. doesn't have the skills. So, yeah. Um, there was, there was one question very early at the beginning. I'm not sure if we can answer this exactly, but the overall topic of what if somebody wants to, with a longer career, wants to change into this, into data science, that's, uh, I think that's interesting career switch advice, 15 year of like charity management strategy experience. For your self-employment, how can I explain the background potentially useful in data engineering or data science? It's a very specific question because we would now need to go into Andrew and what he does. But if somebody wants to get into it, how, how can people show this? Or, or yeah. So if I'm honest, the vast majority of people that join Data Science Infinity are people who are looking to pivot their career over to data science or data analy analytics from somewhere else. So the person who asked that question, you are like the typical person that would join the program. So, so the interesting thing is that I get from the way you are asking the question that, that it, yeah, it, it feels hard thinking of these other skills that you have, trying to utilize them to sell yourself as a data engineer or a data scientist. But I, that's, that's somewhat limited to the technical skill set. So you may not, based on those other roles, have built up the, the specific technical skills that you would want for a data science role or a data engineering role. But that's only so much of what a data scientist or data engineer is. There's so many other skills that make you good at what you do. So for in data science, you know, we talk about the, the sort of technical skills and then the softer skills. And I think what we're going to see over the next few years is those softer skills are going to become more and more and more important, or at least they're going to be the differentiators between good and great data scientists. Because the technical bar is being lowered by things like ChatGPT, but that can't replicate what a human can do in terms of those, those softer skills. So if you, if you learned the technical skills and, and you really just need to spend some time building those up, 
and you start um, building yourself a portfolio of data science specific projects where you can showcase that you can use those technical skills, then you're actually in a pretty strong position because you have years of experience of those softer skills. So talking to stakeholders, convincing stakeholders, um, communicating the impact of things, thinking about how to set up a project so it goes from uh, inception right through to deli delivery, um, you know, communicating successfully with people above you in the business. All of these things are vital to being a good data scientist. So while you may have to just work on the technical side of it, you're actually in a really good position and you're in a better position than somebody who's just fresh out of university or college looking to, to come in because you have all of those skills already. It's really just the, the technical skills are also, they're just tools that you pick and choose to use when you need them. The, the skill around deciding which ones of those tools you should use, do we need to go super complicated here or do we need to do something simple and get it done quickly? Those are the important skills. Those are the skills which actually deliver projects at the end of the day. And so I would see somebody like yourself as a really good candidate to, to successfully move into the field, even though you might not see that yourself. I've seen it time and time and time again with people in the course who, who had the same concerns because, you know, it, it does seem like a big jump over and it does seem intimidating technically, but the technical things, if, if taught well, aren't, aren't hard. They're not too hard for anybody. It's, it's that there's a lot of bad teaching that's gone on, you know, around statistics and coding and stuff. People teach with complexity for complexity's sake and people struggle. But if you, if you learn with intuition and understanding and application, you'd, you'd fly. I guarantee it. Hmm. I think also one error that people are doing is they are trying to make a switch in both in the actual job. So in the technical role and in the domain where they work. Mm. So like for Andrew here, he said he's working in charity management and strategy. I'm not sure which companies or which, which domain he's been working. Like maybe it would be best to also start searching for a, for a, a role in that domain, a data science role. Yeah. hundred percent right. or, or upskill yourself on the technical side of it and keep working in that. There's always ways you can implement the technical skills into your current role. And we're going to see that more and more and more as more roles become at least data centric, you know, let alone data, maybe data science, but data centric. There's always going to be ways if you're the, if you're in your current role, but you've gone off and you've learned the technical skills and you know when to implement those and when to not implement those. And you're the leader of everyone in that space because you've got those technical skills. You're going to be in a really good position to, to accelerate your career even where you are or maybe even move up because you can then manage a team of people who do what you do but also alongside the data teams who are basically going to be intertwined with every team in the next few years i would say uh yamina was asking here like what kind of soft skills would be do you think are, are super important i guess so for me, for me, obviously, like communication is a, is a huge one. I think it's, it's hard to describe exactly what good communication is. But for me, it's being able to explain technical concepts in a way that non-technical people can, can understand. Because if you are a data scientist or a data engineer, you're going to be your stakeholders are going to be marketing or product or or management of some form and they don't come from the necessarily come from the technical background that you come from so you need to you need to be able to explain what you're doing in a way that they understand and, and in the context of the where the business is going like why is this actually solving what we're doing what happens when this other thing takes place you know technically speaking that's that pathway of start, you know starting with intuition and working to um, explain that to stakeholders who are, who are, who give the green light for your product to then go into production or wherever whatever it may be. That's what unlocks the business value actually becoming something real. And, but it all starts back at that point at the at, at the front, which is 
the technical part needs to be moved all the way to production, but that needs to be explained in a way where people who aren't technical know what it is that it, what it, what it does and what happens in different scenarios. So I think that, you know, taking technical things and turning them into something intuitive, that's, that's the skill for me. Um, storytelling, being able to think about something as a narrative, same sort of thing. What I was just mentioning, taking, com taking complexity and, and helping other people understand it, but, but as a story, um, decision, like decision making is a key one. And this is something that I make sure when people in the program are writing up their projects, they showcase not just, I did this and then this and then this, but we had, you know, we had several options available to us in terms of whatever it may be, machine learning models that we could have possibly used. Here's how we decided which one to go forward with. And that, that all comes down to me, what I call a problem solving system. There's nothing specific about what that is or isn't, but you're, the reality is you're seldom going to get hired into a job where on day one, the project you're working on is exactly the same as something you've worked on in the past. It's going to be different because the company's different, the data's different, the um, regulations or whatever it is around the industry you're in are different. So what you need to give hiring managers is the confidence that if they were to give you something, you may not have done it before, but they can see that you can move from inception to you know, or from the start to the end of that process because you have the ability to make decisions, you know, based on some framework. You've got the ability to solve problems as, the, as they come up. I think that is so powerful for people to see as a hiring manager or an interviewer to see that skill. I know uh, they're, they're very, softer skills are harder to explain than technical technical skills, and sometimes they can be harder to practice, but they need just as much time. They need just as much emphasis when you're learning, I think. So, you know, going to webinars about it or, uh, you know, joining a, a, a course all about it, whatever it may be, they, they should take just as much um, of your time investment, I think, as, as the technical skills. Um, yeah, I think that was, uh, uh, who was that? Who Yamina, I think that was a pretty good explanation. So if you have more questions around that, uh, let us know. Um, one thing I saw that twice here, how do you, how do you see the, um, the data engineer role in data science or for data scientists? Like, how interesting is that? So it kind of depends a little bit. So there are, if you're at a bigger company, if you're at a bigger company, it's more likely that there'll be a data science team and a data engineering team, and they'll be separate. They'll obviously sit side by side because they're very related. But you, if you're hired as a data scientist, your primary task is going to be sort of data science skills. And then the data engineering team will take things from there, or, or they'll be the one, you know, providing the data in a certain form that you need it to be in to, to do what you need to do. There's been a lot in the last year online, I think, where the premise is that all data scientists need to also become data engineers. That that That's kind of true in a very small, small team, where you have more more of a remit, and you might be responsible for a lot more. But if, if you are being honest, I mean, if you want to do something really well, you need to be focused on that. You can't spread your resource everywhere. Um, it's like saying that a data scientist also needs to become a marketer, you know, expert marketer because they work alongside that team. I just, I don't think that you have enough resource to do everything all at once, unless you're in a smaller company and you need to. Um, but in saying that, it's very important for data scientists to know what to consider when working with data engineers. So you need to understand the things they need and, and you need to be able to explain what you need from them because you, you just need to understand their role more than be able to do their role, I think. Um, but yeah, it really varies role to role a little bit. Okay. And um, by the way, quick question. Andrew, for you, uh, with my uh, my audio and so on, is it still okay? Can you still did you, did you see any changes in the in the quality of my video? Mm, not sure. I don't think so. Strange. Maybe slightly. I get these, I get these strange messages here that 
My connection is unstable. Very strange. Um, okay, uh, Andrew, how many? How much time do we do we have? Uh, because we're already forty-five minutes in. Do we want to? I'm, go? I have nothing else to do. <laughs> well, I obviously have stuff to do, but uh, no, I'm good no. to keep going. If there's, if there's a few more questions, I'm more than happy yeah. to, uh, to to help out. No, free, no, no, uh, no appointments here after. No, no. Um, oh yeah, that, that's a good one here. And th for us, this is a question that is important for us as well. And I think we too are struggling with this, but also everybody else. How can you maintain relevance in the field of data science if uh, they are not employed in a machine learning focused organization? And for us, I would say for us from the ed uh, education standpoint, we are not employed within companies. We mm -hmm. know roughly what's going on, but we're not working in these jobs. So what's what's your what's your view on this for us and for for Christina here? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And it's something like I, I agree, Andreas, if we're honest, we we think about as well, right, because we are. So for me, I teach the skills that are necessary to become a new data scientist. So those are things that I, to to a reasonable degree, know how to do already, I, I wouldn't teach them otherwise. But um, yeah, I'm not actively in a role doing things at the cutting edge anymore and therefore it is a consideration you know how do you keep up with that i i try to go to webinars and and i try to keep reading things but i'm not there is a difference between that and doing it in practice i've probably been a bit guilty of of not doing it in practice so much um but yeah i, I guess just finding people online who you can learn from you know around those concepts i'm lucky in the fact that i do have this network of you know the whole premise of what i teach is based around hiring managers and recruiters the conversations that i'm having so that kind of keeps me close to the reality of of what's being asked for at least you know in early stage data science but it, it kind of depends the the data science and data engineering equally there's so many things you can do in the field. You you can't keep up with everything and you shouldn't try to keep up with everything. You should, you should be really focused on, on, you know, what are the things that you're, you need in your role to be successful? And if you're not working at the moment, I would try and base that around like, what are the things that I'm most passionate about? Because that helps the learning process so much. You can't sit and just learn things that you don't care for. It's really hard to do that. So if, mm. if you're not working at the moment and you want to keep up with certain, you know, there's computer vision, there's natural language, there's everything. And just just go down the path of the one that you find that you find the most passion for. And therefore, I think that will lead you to something eventually. You know, if you're looking for a role, if you go down that route and you specialize, you'll hopefully be able to find something that you really enjoy. That would be my thoughts. What do you think, Andreas? For me, it was always like trying to soak up as many as I can. Like, look, what are the trends right now on social media? What are people talking about? Which new tools are there? Playing around with stuff. That's for me. I'm, I'm a hands-on guy, so I'm. Oh, there's an interesting tool. People are talking about it. Let's just let's just see how this works. Hmm. And this way yeah, you've got to be careful though don't you because there are so many new tools that are coming out like like i was saying yeah. earlier i was at big data london the conference last week and the number of vendors with new tools whether it's around the data itself or whether it's around machine learning or whether it's around generative ai i mean nobody can know what all of those things do and nobody has a need for all of those things so you kind of do need to pick and choose and if i like i was saying if i have to pick and choose I'm just going to go with where my passion lies, I think, because mm. that that makes it easier for me to properly go down that path. Yeah. You need to be careful. <laughs> yeah. um, which type of projects should we add in resume as a data science student? For internships or, or general, I think. Um, my something that you get a lot is you will you will 
do a course and there'll be a single capstone project, for example. I, I personally advise people not to do just one capstone project. I think that can be a little bit limiting at times. Um, I I like a, a more varied portfolio of projects. Don't think you need to use excessively complicated data or complex algorithms or massive amounts of data. Your portfolio is there to to quickly and easily sell yourself to show that you can do interesting and impactful things. A hiring manager and a recruiter is not going to spend half a day trying to figure out what you're doing. So you're better off doing a varied portfolio of, say, five to 10 projects that cover some of the key skills that you want to showcase. So maybe, a, you know, a project using Tableau for data visualization. This would be more if you know you're going for a data science, data analyst role. So something with data visualization, data visualization, a couple using machine learning perhaps, but different parts of machine learning. So a supervised learning task and maybe something to do with clustering. And maybe if you want to go a bit more advanced, something to do with deep learning. In, in Data Science Infinity, we, we even do projects like there's a project in your portfolio, which is all around A-B testing and hypothesis testing because everybody just does machine learning projects. So you, but, but A-B testing and hypothesis testing is almost on the on the task list of any hiring manager who wants a, a data scientist to come in because it's such a common thing that needs to be done so showcase that um if you can something like sql is hard to put into a pro into a portfolio project so so sometimes what i advise people in the course is to so we have a portfolio site that you add your projects to but make one of them less of a project but more of a, a more of a a written art, excuse me, a written article about how to solve a certain problem that you might get in in coding interviews a lot, or something about the order of execution, just explaining it. So so it, it ticks the box for being there, but it's not like a project where there's like a, a start, a middle, and an end. It's it's kind of just to showcase SQL on your portfolio. Um, yeah, we do we do one like there's a time series one that we do using uh, causal impact analysis, which is really interesting because that's quite a common thing people are looking for for data scientists is to understand, you know, measure and quantify what happened to some rate after an event happened, whether that's like a mailer going out, you know, a campaign going out or whether it's some moment in time on the stock market or whatever it is. Um, another Another really cool one that people don't think about is like association rule learning um, or recommendation systems, but nothing complex, just something simple to show that you that you've got your foot in the door there and that you could you could do something along those lines or build on that. But yeah, like I say, I, I think a varied portfolio of a few different things and you can pick and choose for different roles is better than just one capstone, which is just pages and pages and pages long. Okay. Well, makes sense um let's let's take a last question here what was it uh, i missed it here that's a nice one for the end uh are certifications compulsory for freshers who are joining business intelligence tool? or let's let's make this a more general how do you see certifications in this uh, in so certifications are, can only be a good thing right if the only the only problem with certifications is that you go and get the certificate, but you don't learn the stuff <laughs> that, that got you the certificate. So say you just complete some Udemy course or Coursera course or whatever it is, you get the certificate because you've watched all the content. That in itself to you is not useful. You, nobody else knows that, but you know that. And it means that you can't apply those things. I, I think be really proud of the certifications that you've earned. Um, so you get a lot of people online on, on LinkedIn or wherever else saying certification should be left off your resume and they're not, they don't hold any weight. I think that's true, but only up to a certain point. So what I do in what I advise people with their resume is to, to put the, maybe the maximum three most relevant certifications that you've earned for that particular role. So put the name of the certification in, but underneath that give some context around what it was you got from it and what you can do with the skills that you got from it. So I call it actionable learnings. So what can you action based on the learnings that you got from that certificate? And whether that's a Udemy course or it's a, a course from a university or whatever it is, 
a couple of sentences which change that from just words on paper to the hiring manager or whoever's reading your resume or your CV going, oh, I can see what you've what you've learned and I can see why that's valuable. That's another little sort of cog in their brain turning of the value that you can bring. So, so I think they're good to do because they're learning and learning is where you get the skills to then go and get the job and add value in the job. Just, just add them on your resume in the right way to make sure that that value comes across, not just a list of certificates that gives you, that gives nobody any, any information about you. Mm. So where, where do, where should people add them at the bottom somewhere or? Yeah. So, so generally say you were, say you were uh, transitioning over to data science from another industry, say you were a teacher, I'm just making this up. You're a teacher and you want to move into data science. You've gone through a course like my one and you've built up the portfolio of projects. I would, I would structure your resume. You've got like a motivation at the top. You know, what, what do you, do you're very short the next thing i probably do would put your skills you know a, a list of the key skills because you want to be ticking those boxes with whoever's reading it um, making sure that instantly they see that you're somebody who has the, the skills they need i would then put your projects unless you're coming from a role that has some data science relevance i'll put your projects and then i'd put your work experience and then i'd probably put your certificates your certifications and courses um I probably wouldn't move them up higher than that, but because they're, they're less, they're less proof of something, but they can still be very powerful. So yeah, I, I sort of, everybody's resume, I, I do differently because people are coming from different places and people have different strengths and weaknesses and stuff. And we want to be hitting, hitting the reader with as much good stuff at the start as we can. So that it's sort of different for everyone. All right, uh, Andrew, let's stay. We, we almost talked an hour. Uh, everybody else who had questions here, if you want to get into touch with Andrew, comment under Andrew's post on LinkedIn, right? I think that's the, the yeah. best way, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, check out Data Science Infinity. Uh, I, I'm guessing you also have an email there, right? If yeah, there's... yeah, I do. Yeah, if, if the, the, the website is datascienceinfinity.com with hyphens in between the words. Um, and then, yeah, on there, you can get in touch with me. I've got like an hour long training session that you can go and watch as well, which is kind of me covering all of this stuff in a little bit more detail, um, which can be really good if you're thinking about transitioning over, but you're not quite sure what it is you need to do or what you should be focused on. That could be really useful. Um, and then, yeah, just get in touch either via LinkedIn so you I, you probably need to connect or follow me to be able to send a message, I think. Um, or yeah, you can contact me on the website. So, but I love talking data science, so I will I will absolutely get back to people who who message me. Yeah, the, I have the link uh, in the description of this video. So, amazing. Check that out. All right, thanks, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Talking to you. Great to be here. We'll talk soon, and thanks everybody for being here, having asked us these awesome questions. See you next time. Bye.